we're in a time of year where a lot of folks are thinking about uh, Christ in some form or fashion. It's been our attempt, or will be our attempt, to spend a little time looking at Jesus from the standpoint of his emotions. Uh, we know that he is the Messiah. Uh, we know he is eternal. But we also know he came to this earth for a purpose. And he took upon human form, and so he experiences everything that you and I experience, and you and I don't have emotions without God having given us those emotions. And Jesus demonstrates those for us. Last week we talked about joy, because at his birth it was pronounced. that they, The message to those shepherds was that there were great, tidings are good tidings of great joy because the one who's going to bring joy came and we spent some time looking at Jesus trying to get his disciples to understand that emotion this is not some kind of frail emotion that just wanes and comes and goes but it's a real emotion that God intended for us to embody and he said I want my joy to be in you and for your joy to be full. So that becomes important. But we started out by referring to the fact that most of us, our first impression of Jesus with any kind of emotion is that he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And so as we looked at his announcement of his birth being of great joy, his experience as the Messiah was one of grief and sorrow. Now we have to kind of remove our emoji thinking and, and not just think about joy being these smiley faces where somebody did something nice to us and made us happy. It's deeper than that. And we tried to define that in a way that we would understand that here's a, a, an emotion that allows us to have all the blessings of God with full understanding of those blessings. That we can have this oneness with Him. The same would be true of thinking about grief and sorrow. Again, we might just, in an emoji fashion, think about a frowny face. It didn't get what we wanted, made us unhappy. It's more than that. Here we're talking about this anguish, this pain. And when you think specifically about the definition of sorrow or grief, and those two words are used in the passage that Brother Matt read for us. That he is a man not only of sorrow, but he's acquainted with grief. We're talking about anguish and pain in body, mind, and soul. And there are different times where we experience grief. It might be that we experience that in our bodies. It might be that we experience that in just our, our, our mindset. Or it may be that we experience that in our souls. And all those things were experienced, uh, that emotion was experienced with Christ. Though we don't have a lot recorded about Jesus in his childhood, I think it's interesting the little bit we do have recorded when he was about 12 years old and his parents uh, left him at the temple, or he stayed at the temple. They didn't deliberately leave him there. But they went on their journey back home and found out after uh, a few days' journey that Jesus wasn't with them. So they go back looking for him. And when they find them in the temple, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 48, his mother says to him that, why did you do this to us? He said, your father and I came back sorrowing. There's that word that we use for grief, sorrow, anguish. They came back sorrowing. It, it affected their mindset. They weren't sure where he was or what might have happened to him. And it caused them discomfort. It caused them pain. Now Jesus' response was, Do you not know about have to be about my father's business? On that occasion, it doesn't indicate that he was sorrowing, that he got left behind. He was there on purpose. But that word is used to, to cause us to realize that that Mary and uh, Joseph were pained by not knowing where he was. And pained in their search for him, it caused them pain in their minds. 
that emotional experience of saying, where is he? Why didn't we keep up with him? Or whatever the circumstance it might be, and it's described as her saying, we were sorrowing. So that's only really the context that we, we have in his, in his childhood that we can see. I want you to file away the context of Isaiah 53 and those verses are read. And add to that, verse 11 of Isaiah 53, when it said, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So it depicts God looking at the sacrifice that, that's going to be made, that this this Lamb of God that's going to be offered, this Lamb that's going to be led to the slaughter, that God would look at that and, and that travail, that suffering that He will go through will satisfy God on our behalf. So here's a, a prophetic understanding that He's going to go through that sorrow, that grief, that pain for us. You see, we typically at the end of our sermon extend uh, an invitation, but really when we're proclaiming God's Word, from first word to the last word is the invitation. It's not just those last few words. It's I want us to have that mindset that here we're talking about the Messiah and the sorrow and the grief, the pain that He underwent, and the purpose behind that. Brother Joe read for us in preparing us to partake of the communion from Romans, where here God commended His love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what this passage is talking about in Isaiah 53. But He didn't just come and, and proclaim all of us saved. He came and bore what you and I deserve to be bearing. And with that came that grief and that sorrow. So I want you to keep that mindset about the pain that his body will undergo. He'll bear our stripes. He did bear our stripes, but when this prophecy is being said, that was future tense. He was going to bear our stripes. He was going to suffer for us. He's going to have that pain, that emotional experience in his body for us. He would feel the agony of that brutality of the beatings and the crucifixion on the cross for us. And we'll bring back that in the invitation because you see, don't really understand nor comprehend Luke, or rather Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 when Jesus would say, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest under your soul. You don't really appreciate that. You can't connect to that emotionally unless you understand the emotion that was experienced to provide that. That's who he was and that's what he did. He provided that for us. When you look also at passages like Mark chapter 3 in those first five verses, you see the agony that he had in his mind concerning the circumstances that he, he came to this earth and found. Now he's God, and so there's, there's a knowledge level that, that God would have. But as the Messiah who came and took on human form, he's walking among men, he's trying to prepare men for his, the salvation that he's bringing, and he sees that they have just the opposite agenda. They don't really pay attention that He is the fulfillment of all these prophecies. They're not paying attention to His message. They're not listening to His invitation. They're trying to find ways to trap Him and to accuse Him. And this is one of those occasions in Mark chapter 3. He goes into the synagogue and He knows that they're watching Him. It happened to be on a Sabbath day. And He knows He's being watched by those Jewish leaders. Listen to these words in those first five verses. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, 
Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? And they held their peace. Now here it is. Listen to verse 5. When you get that definition of sorrow, of grief, of that emotion that Jesus experienced, here's that emotional part of His mind being anguished by this attitude and this disposition. They're not paying attention that the one who could heal the withered hand could not do that without the power of God. They're completely blinded to who He is. And verse 5 says, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Did you hear it? There's that emotion. Now we'll talk about anger later, but here he has this emotion that he is grieved at their hardness. He is processing this in his mind and, and watching their behavior, even with this miraculous deed that he's about to do, he knows they're not interested in the power he just demonstrated. They're interested that he exercise that power on the Sabbath day, and that's all they were waiting on. They were watching for that purpose, and that grieved him. Here he is coming to save them, sharing the message of salvation with them, to extend this invitation to them. And they're completely blinded to it. And so his mind is grieved. When you look at passages like Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, there you fast forward and he's coming into Jerusalem and, and now he's getting really close to the time he's going to be, be sacrificed. And as he comes in in this triumphant way he looked about the city of Jerusalem and it said and he wept his attitude and disposition oh Jerusalem Jerusalem how often would I have gathered you as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings and you would not and it said and Jesus wept what did he weep for He's looking at this city, this, this holy city, this city where the temple resides, this city where God met His people throughout all that time of, of the Mosaic Age, this city that God had blessed so long in so many ways that should have been so prepared to the coming Messiah, and they weren't. And He grieved Him. He's a man who is acquainted with grief. He is mentally acquainted with grief. He's thinking about this city and how they could have received him, could have recognized him, and they don't know who he is. They're the fulfillment of, of John chapter 1. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. It grieved him. He wanted them to recognize him and, and accept what he was doing for them. But then you see that it grieved him in his soul on a number of occasions. We know what his body's going to endure. We're going to reflect on that. We did reflect on that in our communion. We partook of an emblem that represented what his body endured. We understand that part. We know what the prophecy was talking about in Isaiah 53, but sometimes we don't realize that he experienced these emotions while he was here. But when you look at passages like John chapter 1, and you walk with the Lord when he gets to the city of Lazarus, and with Mary and Martha, and he sees this the happenings of grief. And it uses this terminology. When he sees Mary weeping, and she is disappointed that the Lord wasn't there, he could have saved her brother. And he sees those who came to visit the family and during their time of, of bereavement. And they were weeping. Everybody's crying because of Lazarus' death. And he describes this inner feeling that Jesus had, this emotion. And it said, listen, 
he groaned in his spirit. He saw what they were going to have to continue to experience. All of us are going to have to experience. The consequences of living in a sin-cursed earth is that we have to physically die. And it causes us great pain, grief, sorrow. And we have a Messiah who felt the depth of that sorrow. He didn't just think about it, and well, that's disappointing. This is not just a, a frowny face moment. It groaned in his spirit. He feels for them. He has that emotion where he agonized over it. It caused him pain. When I think about that, it causes me to realize how blessed I am to have such a Savior that would groan in his spirit over my sufferings, which gives an enhancement to his invitation, come to me. Somebody that really cares about me, who, who really has felt what I feel, who knows that emotional part of grief and sorrow, wants to take it away, wants to help me bear it. It gives it special meaning and inspires me. When he gets in John 13 to the point that he announces to his disciples, one of them is going to betray him. Twice in that context. It uses that word, sorrow, grief. Carries with it that agonizing over the pronouncement. It says, first of all, that the disciples were grieved when they heard it. And they each began to ask, Lord, is it me? Is it, am I going to be the one who betrays you? We see when you look at the, the context and you look at it a little broader... It said that Jesus was troubled in his spirit. He agonized over it. This is one of his chosen twelve. This is someone that he held close to him. This is someone who knew him like nobody else knew him. This is someone who heard him like no one else had the privilege of hearing him. This is someone who spent Intimate, private, close time with him. And he was going to betray him. That emotion of agonizing over that, of, of feeling that, of being disappointed that that was going to happen, but knowing it was going to happen and the consequences for this person. It said it troubled Jesus in his spirit. It grieved him, caused him sorrow. A real emotion that sometimes we don't attribute in the right context to Jesus and his experience while he's on this earth. And probably what moves us the most is when we get to what we read often during our time of, of communion. And we get to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 37 and following. And we see Jesus there gets to Gethsemane and and he's trying to prepare his disciples for his departure. And he takes with him Peter and James and John. And he goes to Gethsemane. And he goes a distance. And it said in verse 37, And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. We use that terminology when it comes to grief, don't we? When it comes to sorrow, we talk about it being heavy. It's not a light-hearted experience. It's not something that we do flippantly. It's not just a fleeting moment or experience for us. It's heavy. It's difficult to bear. Now Jesus has wrote, reached that hour. He knows the cross is looming. And it said he began to be sorrowful. He began sorrowing, feeling that emotion of this occasion. It carried that emotion on a lot of levels. When you look at verse 38 of that context, it said, Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. 
Now see, when you're looking at the definition of grief, of sorrow, of that emotion, it means that we experience pain or anguish either in our bodies, in our minds, or in our spirits or our soul. Now Jesus, in his mind, emotionally, he's beginning that sorrowing process. He feels the weight of what's about to happen. And now it said, he specifically says to them that he is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. It's heavy. It's real. And he is feeling it. That's the emotion we need to understand when we're talking about, about sorrow. Tonight we'll make application to us about how do we handle sorrow how do we distinguish between the right kind of sorrow and sorrow that we shouldn't have? But we want to talk about the sorrow that Jesus had this morning. See, it was purposeful. It was deep. It was abiding. And he embodied the definition of grief and sorrow. So you see, when you turn a page... In Matthew 26 and following, you have him feeling it in his body. Now you get to see and visualize what Brother Matt read for us. He's the one that's going to bear our stripes and our burdens. He's going to bear it in his body. He's going to feel every single stripe that he receives. It's going to cause sorrow to his body that, to endure that. For me and for you. It's an emotion. It didn't just happen and he didn't feel anything. This is a brutality that he went through for us. That's what our sins deserve. That's what our transgressions demand. That's what Isaiah 53 and verse 11 is saying. It appeased the God of heaven that that price was paid. And it echoes that for us. That we don't ever need to forget that he sees the travail of the soul, of the agony that was endured by the Lamb of God Himself. When Jesus is experiencing those things in His body, it had to be something that would just take Him to the edge of physical death itself. You've heard all the, the statistical information about the number of people who underwent beatings like that that did not physically survive. The intentions were to get you to that point where you were just barely hanging on the physical life. That you could feel every bit of the torture. Well that was anguish. That was pain. I hope we appreciate the fact that Jesus did that for us. That that was experiencing that emotion of grief, of sorrow, on all levels. He mostly looked around and knew he was coming to save these people and they were rejecting him, trying to trap him, discarding what he said, betraying him. He's conscious of that. He sees that. He, he processes that. He acknowledges that. He's acquainted with it. It grieves him. So much so that when he gets to that point, he agonizes in his very soul. He feels the heaviness of that emotion. Now, as I said, this sermon is an invitation intended to cause us to listen to him to saying, come unto me. Say, well, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with life and there are a lot of things going on and there are all kinds of these emotions. Come unto me. Someone who has experienced all those emotions on all those levels Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I experienced those things for you so that I could give you rest. That's the purpose of the invitation. That's what every sermon is intended to do, is to cause us to see Him and understand Him and, and then respond to His invitation. In Hebrews chapter 4, in causing us to understand how important it is for Him to, to be our Savior, it refers to Him as our High Priest. You see a High Priest, 
was chosen from among the people, and he was to represent God to the people and represent the people to God. And you see, he knew from the people what it was like because he suffered like the people suffered. He felt what the people felt. And so it described to us as our Savior being that high priest. In verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4, he said, Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to profession. Listen carefully. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but in all points was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Ah, oh, that's the invitation. The one who's experienced those emotions for us, who knows our emotional state, knows our spiritual state, can relate to us. He felt that heaviness on all levels. And mind, body, and spirit. He's our high priest. So we can respond to him knowing that he really, truly understands. And that he can bear it for us. He's demonstrated that he can do that. What does that mean to you? What kind of emotion does that create in you? You see, sometimes religiously people get all worked up and get in a superficial way emotional. But these are real, real emotions that had to be experienced for real reasons by a real Messiah who endured all those things for us, felt them. He did just come and, and float around while he was here and, and kind of see what was going on. He experienced it. In mind, body, and soul, the sorrow and grief. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. So he could be our high priest. If you've not come to him, not responded to that invitation, what else could he possibly do in what he's done? That you would know that you're responding to him. And therefore, when he suggests to you that I want you to be saved, and he tells you how to be saved, that you know he authored those terms for you, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Isn't that interesting? That chapter 4 tells us he's our high priest. Chapter 5 says he authored Salvation for us, to all them that obey Him. What in the world would ever keep us from not obeying Him when we know what He experienced for us? Our emotion ought to be to want to respond to Him in obedience, to know that He bore it for us. If you're willing to acknowledge your faith in Him, turn away from your sins in repentance, confess His name before those who are assembled, submit your life to Him in baptism, you will have listened to what he had to say. Come unto me. And you will have all the blessings he experienced. Yes, this life will have anguish and pain in mind, body, and spirit. But we have a Savior who will help us bear it, who knows how it feels and knows what we're enduring. Those of us who've done that, sometimes we get busy and sometimes we get distracted and sometimes we just get burdened down with a lot of heavy things. Life happens. It's cruel sometimes. It's difficult. It's heavy. And sometimes in our minds, it seems to be more than we can bear. Jesus is the one who understands. He bore our sorrows for us. He's waiting for us to return to Him. He'll forgive us of anything that would stand between us and Him. He'll do that now. He'll do that gladly. And willingly and joyfully, while together we stand and while we sing.